Hi, this is a video for the principle of conservation and momentum. The idea of this video is that you watch it before the lesson, so that you turn up to the lesson already knowing what you need to know, and you would have done some tasks that I've set during the course of the video as well. And the idea with doing that is that by the time you get to the lesson, you've had time to think about things, find out any issues when you're doing the uh, tasks that are set, so hopefully you're better equipped to ask questions of the teacher about anything you need to clarify for, with the, uh, the knowledge that you need to have that we cover. So that's the idea for, for the video. Uh, I'm going to go through the concept, I'm going to give a few examples as well, and I'll also include some links to other relevant practicals or animations, so look out for those in the course of the video as well. So let's get started. Actually, the content is not that big. So the principle of conservation of momentum is this. The sum of the momentum before a collision or explosion is equal to the sum of the momentum after the collision or explosion provided that no external forces act. That's what it is. So that's the principle of conservation of momentum. Know that it's, we're talking about the sum of the momentum before is equal to the sum of the momentum after. So usually we deal with a couple of objects, they collide or there's an explosion that forces them apart. And it's the momentum of object A plus the momentum of object B before, which is equal to the momentum of object A plus that of B after. That's what's equal. So it's not saying the momentum of object A is equal to before is equal to the momentum of object A after. The momentum of the individual objects will change, but the sum of the momentum is equal before and after. And it's provided that there's no external forces acting. So a classic one would be friction. Now in reality, friction will act, but uh, this principle still applies if, you, if friction is very, very small and uh, particularly in the instant before and the instant after the collision or explosion, then this will give you values that correlate extremely well with reality. So if you look at the instants before and after. Sometimes instead, instead of saying external forces, people may talk about a closed system, and that's what a closed system is, one where there's no external forces acting on the system. The system being the two objects that are colliding or exploding. Okay, so every time an object changes its momentum for the sum of the momentum of the system before and after to be equal, there must be some, some other object must change its momentum as well. So let's take an example of a cannon firing a cannonball. Two objects, cannon, cannonball. You fire the cannonball, so the cannonball's momentum changed. It went from being stationary to uh, moving at high velocity. So from your knowledge of momentum, you know mass times velocity is the momentum. It started with zero momentum and ended up with a large amount of momentum in that direction, let's say. So in order for the this to be true, the total momentum before was zero because neither the cannon nor the cannonball were moving. Well, I haven't actually established that, but let's say they are. They're, they're both stationary. And afterwards, the cannonball is moving off with a large amount of momentum in that direction. So for the total momentum after to be zero, something must have gained momentum in that direction. Momentum is a vector quantity, as you know, so therefore, uh, you need momentum in the other direction for the total to be zero. What gained the momentum? Well, there's two objects, remember? The cannon and the cannonball. The cannonball, we know, 
The cannon must therefore be the other object which has gained momentum in the opposite direction. So there's always a recoil when an object changes its momentum. And uh, in the case of the cannon and cannonball, the cannon has a much larger mass. So that's why the cannon doesn't recoil with an incredibly high velocity comparable with the velocity of the cannonball. So that's uh, recoil, watch out for that. And from this as well, we know that the impulse of two objects that are involved in a collision or explosion is always equal and opposite. So you take the example of the cannon cannonball, the change in momentum of the cannonball was equal to the change of momentum of the cannon, and they're in opposite directions in order to be zero. That's always the case, and you can actually show that that's consistent with Newton's third law as well. So if you feel up to a challenge, you can have a go at trying to show that mathematically. Um, before I go into some examples, a bit of recent news from NASA was that they developed an engine which violates the principle of conservation of momentum. So you might want to have a look at that. Um, if you look at, if you want to find out more about that, I'll add a link into an article about that. It's still quite new news, so there's probably more to come out about it, how it works, um, why it works, why it violates the principle of conservation of momentum, so I'll add that in. Let's do some examples. Okay. Like any other example with mechanics, the general idea is that we look at the situation before, and then we look at it after, and then we can bring this in. We can have two objects I'm going to start with a numerical example and then we'll try and generalise it a little bit more as we go on Okay It's the after, sorry So we've got one kilogram mass coming in at 10 meters per second to the right towards this five kilogram mass. And then afterwards, the, five, uh, the one kilogram mass becomes stationary and the five kilogram mass moves, up, moves off at some velocity v. So uh, what we want to do is find out what that velocity is. What velocity does the five kg mass move off at? <coughs> I've drawn the vector to the right, but it may not necessarily be, at the right, be to the right in other situations. Uh, you always have to be careful about your positives and negatives, but I'll say more about that moment in a moment. Okay, if you can solve that, go ahead and solve it now. Uh, let's go through the solution now. Solving for V. Sometimes, in, like in this case, you can probably, some of you will just see what the answer is intuitively based on the numbers that I gave you. So you, you may just write down an answer. But it's good to know how you arrive at that answer. So let's go through the math for solving that. Okay, the sum of the momentum before. Uh, 1 times 10. So 1 kilogram mass times 10 plus 5 times zero. That has zero velocity. That's the total momentum before, and we know that the total momentum before is equal to the total momentum after from our principle. So that should be equal to one times zero plus five times v. Okay, now we can see immediately that term, that term they're gonna cap, they're gonna drop out because they're both equal to zero. So now we have 1 times 10 is 10 is equal to 5v. v is equal to 10 over 5, which is 2.0. 
Okay, so this object came in at 10 meters per second. This one moves off at two meters per second. Uh, those of you who intuitively saw the answer as two were probably thinking, well, this object is five times smaller than this one, so this one's gonna, because this one's five times bigger, it's gonna move off at a fifth of the velocity of this object here. Anyway, that's how you would arrive at the answer, just putting all of the steps in mathematically, two meters per second. So that's example one. Okay, I can keep the before and after set up because we're going to use it again. Okay, before we have M 3M. And this comes in at velocity U. U for the velocity, the initial velocity. And I believe that means on velocity V. Okay, so now we, this is an algebraic solution, so we're generalizing it a little bit. Um, solve that for V in terms of U. All right, so have a go at solving that. V in terms of U, so your final equation will be, we'll have V as the subject on the left-hand side. Now let's see what the solution is for that. Total momentum before on this side, m times u for this object, plus 3m times 0, 3m is 0, and uh, that's equal to the total momentum after, so that's m times 0, plus 3m times v. And then we can uh, cancel these two terms out here. Those are both equal to zero, similar to the first example. We have zero velocities there. And we can also cancel out gms, because if we divide both sides of the equation by m, both these terms have m in cancel out. So we get u equals 3v, and then v is equal to u divided by Similarly, you could probably use your intuition a little bit here and see, well, this one's three times bigger, so it's going to move off with a third of the velocity. But that's how you would work it through, working out the total momentum before, total momentum after, equating them, and then simplifying. Okay, example three then. Two masses, that's a lowercase and uppercase M, and the uppercase M you can see is the larger mass. I, I know it's just bigger spatially, but it's also, I'm saying it's the larger mass. Okay, now this is an example of an explosion. So there may be some uh, explosive material between the two masses, and that's ignited causing them to be forced apart like this. So that this low, smaller mass has a velocity to the left and the larger to the right. What I want you to do is derive an expression for V2. So an expression for V2. Okay, so if you can do that now, go ahead and try doing that. Pause the video and try doing it. And Okay, now a little bit more little bit more information here. Before you start doing anything, what you should have done is decided on a positive direction. This is something I didn't actually do in examples one and two, and just kind of got on, did the maths. But that worked because if anything was moving, it's moving to the right. So because it's moving in the same direction and everything had positive values 
then, I, then it was okay. But here, because this has a velocity to the left and this to the right in this situation, then we've got velocities in opposite directions. So you have to account for that with a positive direction. So that's a very important thing. And that now we'll try solving for this problem, deriving an expression for V2. We want an expression for V2. And write a comment about V2. To comment on it in the context of this problem that I've given you to solve. Okay, so let's go through the solution. Okay, expression for V2, taking to the right as the positive direction. Feel free to take the positive direction to the left if you like. Your, your equation for V2 will still be the same as long as you're consistent with it. Okay, uh, just on that note, it's very important that you are aware that you need to do that that you do do it and that you're consistent with it, okay? Choosing the positive direction. So let's write down our expression. First thing is look at the situation before. Neither object is moving, they're both stationary. So therefore, the total momentum before equals zero, all right? Very important, total momentum before is zero. And that actually tells us that the total momentum after will be zero. So we know that the momentum here will add up to zero. Let's uh, do the algebra. So we've got zero on the left hand side, that's our total momentum before. The total momentum after, m times v1, plus capital M. V2. Okay, one thing I didn't do, you may have spotted it, and that is V1 is to the left, that's in the negative direction, so therefore I need to give this term a negative here. Or if you like, M times minus V1 in brackets, but the same thing. Okay, so now I can work with that equation, I haven't left anything out. V2. Now this term here, I can add it on to both sides of the equation and cancel out over here and appear over here and it's a positive, positive term. So I've got mv1 over here and I divide by that m, so I get v1 times lowercase m over uppercase m. So what I've got there is that v2 is equal to the other velocity, v1, multiplied by a ratio of the masses. That's important because the units for mass cancel out here, so I have actually got units of velocity on both sides of the equation, so that equation is valid. Uh, let's comment on V2. Do you remember that I said lowercase m is smaller than uppercase m? So in that case, this term here, this ratio of masses, that's always going to be less than 1. So I've got something less than 1 multiplied by V1. So, because little m is less than large m, v2 will always be less than v1. So let's take a large value for this ratio, 0.9. Well, that means that v2 is always going to, is going to be 0.9 times v1, so v2 is always going to be less than v1. That's what that expression tells us for this problem here. What I'll do now is add in a couple of links for other videos that may be helpful for you with momentum and conservation of momentum.